If you ask the average person today what the manned space program is, you'll hear things like the International Space Station and the Space Shuttle. We see astronauts talking via satellite to high school students when performing experiments in space on long-term stays. Barring a tragedy, few of us paid attention to the shuttle launches. And once the investigations were finished, they were out of the news cycle again. Those of us with shiny adult hair remember another time, a time of Apollo. On a cold December night in 1972, I remember standing outside my home in Fort Lauderdale and watching Apollo 17 take our last manned mission to the moon. Three years earlier, we had gathered around the black and white television in the den to watch Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on the moon from Apollo 11. And when I was in my medical residency, we would go to the theater to learn about the right stuff of the Mercury 7. But between the heroic Mercury astronauts, the moon landings, the shuttle disasters, and the high school lessons, somebody had to teach us how to live and work in space. The 10-man missions that taught us how to maneuver in orbit, to walk in space, to rendezvous and to dock. All the routine skills and the ability to live up to 8 to 10 days in orbit. Not only learning to do the task, but training the men that would later go on to land on the moon in Apollo and command the space shuttles. This series is about Project Gemini. We'll go over each of the missions, profile the crews, discuss what they did and what they learned. It seems as though history has forgotten them, but they are the ones that helped get us to the moon. And the triumph of the shuttle and the ISS was built upon the foundation they carefully laid in the mid-60s. So join me now as we review the two-man crews of Gemini, a bridge between Mercury and Apollo. Gemini 4 was the second of the manned Gemini launches, with crew Ed White, and James McDivitt. It was the first multi-day Gemini flight covering 66 orbits in four days. Gemini 4 saw the first American spacewalk by astronaut Ed White. During the flight, the crew conducted nearly a dozen engineering and scientific experiments. However, their attempt to visually rendezvous with their booster stage from their Titan II rocket was unsuccessful. Now, a couple of interesting Bits of trivia on Gemini 4. It was the first American space launch that was controlled from the new Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, Texas. This was later renamed the Johnson Flight Center in 1973. Also, the Gemini 4 launch was the first broadcast to a live audience via satellite, the Intelsat 1 or the Early Bird, which was put into orbit to handle communications between North America and Europe in April of 1965. It was later part of the network that handled the first international broadcast in 1967, which featured the Beatles and Picasso, and artists from 19 different countries. Pilot Ed White was a graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point and a fighter pilot with the Air Force. Graduate of the Air Force Test Pilot School, he was selected in the second group of astronauts along with Neil Armstrong. James McDivitt is a Air Force fighter pilot from the Korean War. He had gone to high school about 15 miles from me at Kalamazoo Central, and like Ed White, is a graduate of the University of Michigan. Like White, he was selected in the second group of astronauts along with Neil Armstrong. Gemini 4 launched from Cape Kennedy on June 3, 1965. Let's have a look at some highlights from the flight. Gemini 4 is counting down on the launch pad. As the count goes into its final two hours, the crew arrives at pad 19. There have been no holds. The weather is good. The astronauts enter the elevator and ride it to the Erector White Room, which surrounds Gemini 4. The crew enters the spacecraft. The hatches are sealed, 7.32 Eastern Standard Time. The crew is now a part of the countdown. They begin checking out the spacecraft systems. It is T minus 100 minutes. The launch vehicle and spacecraft continue the clean count, interrupted only by a balky erector which didn't want to lower properly. That cost us some time, but presented no serious problem. At T minus 30 minutes, the pad was cleared. Now there is just a spacecraft, launch vehicle, and two men on top of it. All systems are good at this time. The launch control at the Cape. T minus 10 minutes and counting. 
six minutes before launch. The spacecraft test conductor signed off to the spacecraft with these final words. Okay, Jim, have a good flight. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition and start. Lift off. At 10.16 Eastern Standard Time, Gemini 4 was on its way. We have a roll program initiated. I know. Flight to launch have started. And in sync. And in sync. Roger. Roll program completed. McDivitt reports. And the pitch program has been initiated. Mark 50 seconds and we're go. Guidance reports ago, the flight trajectory looks very, very close to right on the nominal value. That's good. Flight data pretty noise, but we're okay. Once Gemini 4 cleared the tower, control was transferred from Cape Canaveral to Houston. The manned spacecraft center at Houston, Texas would control the flight till splashdown. We have staging, and it's been confirmed here on the ground. Trust looks good. Gemini 4 entered orbit with an insertion velocity of 25,745 feet per second, within 11 feet per second of planned velocity. The apogee of the first orbit was 177.6 statute miles. The perigee, 100.8 statute miles. Command pilot McDivitt started to work at once, attempting to fly an airplane formation with the second stage of the launch vehicle. The full resources of NASA in Houston were on hand to support Gemini 4. From a new three-storied building, flight controllers at the manned spacecraft center assumed direct control of the mission for the first time in the space program. The mission director now checked the status of a possible rendezvous. Ask him about his track with the launch vehicle. Uh, sure. I have it started this time. It's directly below me, about uh, four or five feet up on the front dock. All right, here we Everything seemed favorable at that time. But as the first orbit progressed, the second stage of the launch vehicle drew away. Roger, pilot. Uh, we still have the booster. We're out quite a ways from it now. Uh, it's taken a little more fuel than we had anticipated. To really make a major effort to close this last thing or to save the fuel? The answer was almost immediate from the mission director. You might tell him, uh, as far as we're concerned, we want to save the fuel. We're concerned about the light time more than we are matching that booster. Okay. And that was it. Okay. The second stage of the launch vehicle went on to become simply Space Object 1391. It would burn up over the Mid-Atlantic two days later. Yeah, my phone. Okay, we're giving you a go for your EVA at this time. Okay. The crew started their checklist for EVA, but Command Pilot McDivitt decided not to rush things. He elected to go for EVA on the third revolution. Hawaii, Jim I-4. Go ahead, Jim I-4. Next pass around. I don't think we want to try. Very good. Tell Roger, him we're happy with Next that. pass around. Tell him we're happy with that. Most of the world waited 100 miles below. The crew had completed final preparations. The cabin was depressurized and the hatch open. Coming up on Hawaii, McDivitt reported that he was satisfied and ready to begin EVA. Search, you ready to have him get out? Roger, flight, we're go. He's got some uh, nice elevated rates, which we expected, and uh, he's, he's really speeded it up, but he looks great. Let's go. Okay. Hawaii, Houston flight. Houston flight, Hawaii, Capcom, go. Tell him we're ready to have him get out when he is. Gemini 4, Hawaii, Capcom. We just had word from Houston. We're ready to have you get out whenever you're ready. Okay, we've got our go now, is that right? Affirmative. Okay, we're still doing a little work right here. Roger, understand. Get his status, Hawaii. Gemini 4, Hawaii, Cap Drum. Okay, I'm separating from the spacecraft. Okay, separating from the spacecraft this time, Hawaii. Okay, my feet are out. Okay, my feet are out. I think I'm dragging a little bit, so I don't want to fire the gun yet. Okay, I'm out. Okay, he's out. He's close to free. Okay, I put a little roll in, took it right out. Okay. 
Am I in your view, Jimbo? Well, you know, I can't see it, I'm afraid to. Don't swear it, I'll come over to you. Let's take your club, I'll leave the study cup. All right. Okay, I rolled off, I'm rolling to the right now. It's under my own influence. There goes a... Looks like a thermal glove, Jim. It is, yes. All right. Now, I've come about the spacecraft, and I'm coming back down now. I'm under my own control. Okay, I'm coming over. You look beautiful. I feel like a million dollars. I'm coming back to you. The gun, the gun works real good, Jim. Let me get over here where I can see. Yeah. Well, I got, got me upside down. I, okay, don't fire the truck. Make that flag look pretty. Yep. Okay, I'm right by the I'm right by the stud antenna now. Okay. Hey, let me let me get some for you. I already getting some tremendous pictures of you. Let me try again with the hospital. Okay, I think I've exhausted my okay. air now. Stay right there. I had very good control with it. I just needed more air. Okay, stand by. Let me take a couple pictures, All right. Oh, that's right. Capcom, uh, it's very easy to maneuver with the gun. The only problem I have is I haven't got enough fuel. I've exhausted the fuel now, but I was able to maneuver myself out in front of the spacecraft back. I maneuvered right up back on the back of the adapter. Just above Jim, came back into his view. This is the greatest experience. I've, it's just tremendous. Right now, I'm standing on my head, and I'm looking right down. It looks like we're coming up on the coast of California. Did I go on a slow rotation to the right? There is absolutely no disorientation associated with it. One thing about it, Alan, when it gets out there and starts wiggling around, it sure makes the spacecraft stop the control. Okay, I'm drifting down underneath the spacecraft. There's no difficulty with uh, recontacting the spacecraft. It's all very soft particularly as long as you move nice and slow. I feel very thankful to have the experience to be doing this. I'll bring myself in and put myself out in your view, Jim. Is he taking pictures? Okay, do you want me to maneuver for you now, Ed? No, I think you're doing fine. What I'd like to do is get all the way out, Jim, and get a picture but the whole space gap, I don't seem to be doing that. Yet. Yeah, I noticed that. You can't seem to get far enough away. No. Texas, remote oh, your air to ground. Here. California, go local. I'm coming back down on the space gap. Listen, it's all the difference in the world with this gun. When that gun was working, I was maneuvering all around. Just for your information, Ed, we're only down to 48% on our O2. Okay. He's got... Uh, Open pressure is about 8.30, so stay right up there. Let me get a picture of it. Uh, yeah. No, not now. I'm out of it. Okay, you got about five minutes. Okay, I will let myself go out now. Jiminy 4, Houston. You know, Ed, the thing about the reference you were talking about looks like it's your right. Yeah, you don't even need one. Jiminy 4, Houston, Capcom. Gosh, this is Jim. Uh, what, got any message for us? The flight director says get back in. Okay. okay. One. Where are we over now, Jim? I don't know. We're coming over to the west, west there, and they want you to come back in now. Back in? Back in. All right, sir. We've been trying to talk to you for a while here. Coming in. you got about four minutes to hold from you to LOS. History will record that Command Pilot McDivitt opened the hatch at 2.42 Eastern Standard Time. And a little after 3 o'clock along the eastern seaboard, Pilot White had opened up a new frontier for Americans to explore. In 21 and one half minutes, EVA was completed. Now it was the 60-second revolution, coming up on Hawaii. The orbital attitude and maneuver thrusters were fired to assure orbital decay and re-entry if the retrograde rockets did not fire. Now television and radio were back again. A nation paused on a Monday morning, waiting to fly in with the crew of Gemini 4. Give him an eight-minute mark.
mark to uh, Retro 5. 74 Hawaii, stand by for an eight minute mark to Retro 5. Two, one, mark. Mark. Gemini 4 would fly the same type of re-entry as Gemini 2, an earlier unmanned flight. We will illustrate the re-entry of McDivitt with film from that flight. This is an onboard camera, Gemini 2, looking through the spacecraft window. The film is reproduced at four times normal speed. Feeling great. How about you? Gemini 4, Houston, Capcom. Hello, Houston, Gemini 4. Uh, Roger, you started your rolling reentry? Roger. Roger. Yeah, uh, your weather is still very good, Jim. Okay. Communications with the ground break off, but the onboard tape recorder is running. We listen to two men returning to Earth after four days in space. Look at us. We're making some fire, too. Yeah, we're making a putting our ionization layer out. They're not reading it anymore now, probably. Here goes Florida. Is that Florida? Ugly fish. See it on your side? Yeah. They're red hot, Jim. Sit back and relax. We ain't gonna do much about it from here out. Get ready for the cheek, I think we got the thing that gets me about this sequence is that these guys are falling out of orbit like a meteor and they're discussing the sights. They could be sitting in their living room talking about a call at a football game. Uh, we're just about ready to put the uh, parachute up and stand by. Hey, parachute's coming. There's a D-read. There's a D-read. And it's a good one, isn't it? There's a Nobody can read me now, but does that parachute look great? You're not kidding. During re-entry, the USS Wasp launched 13 search and recovery aircraft. Gemini 4 splashed down at 12.13 Eastern Standard Time, June 7, 1965. It was sighted by a search aircraft seven minutes later. Navy frogmen swiftly attached the flotation collar, and at 12.39, Command Pilot McDivitt opened the hatch. Both men took a deep gulp of fresh air. Four days in space had ended. The command pilot requested a pickup by helicopter, and in a matter of minutes, the prime recovery helicopter had the crew safely on board. They were flown to the deck of the WASP. Admiral William McCormick, commander of the Western Atlantic Recovery Forces and his staff, offered the first formal congratulations on the flight. The crew then walked to the carrier elevator, bound for their physical examination. Following the Gemini 4 flight, James McDivitt went on to command Apollo 9, which tested the command service module and the lunar module. He then went on to serve as the program director for Apollo 12 through 16, retiring from NASA in 1972. Astronaut Roger Chafee was a member of Group 3 and CAPCOM during Gemini 3. He and astronaut Ed White, who performed America's first spacewalk, died in the tragic fire on the pad with Apollo 1 and Gus Grissom. It was White's responsibility to open the hatch in an emergency, however this required Grissom to vent the cabin, and he was unable to do it due to the fire. Even though he was unable to do so, his body was found trying to open the hatch in a vain effort to save his crewmates. Thank you all for stopping by to watch this video. I hope you enjoyed it. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Please remember to like and subscribe to my channel.